name is Mark Burick, and if you're here, it's probably because in some way, shape, or form, you are trying to get better at beach volleyball. We teach people how to get better playing, coaching, and today we have a really interesting conversation because we have somebody who's played, who's coached, and who has come from the organizational side. So all of these tournaments and, and regional activities, regional events, uh, building with academies now, and all the way up until almost government level where he's working uh, with Flagler County Parks and Rec, it, he's somebody who's seeing all sides of it. So this is a conversation that you guys are going to be interested in if you like organizing events, if you, uh, <laughs> if you see people failing or you think people could do better from the organizational side and maybe you're wondering why what's so difficult about getting things done in terms of tournament organization uh and putting on big events so from a player side from a coach side from an organizer side this is going to be a great episode he's currently the director of beach volleyball for dme academy uh down in florida and he is like we said, the Flagler County Parks and Recs Department. He's a special event coordinator there, and he's been managing sports and recreation programs for the past six years. And I want to welcome, with a big open heart, Craig Lanager. What's going on, man? Hey, how are you? Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> man, I it's so fun for me to see it, like different sides of sports because we, we interview a lot of players right we interview a lot of mm -hmm. most of the coaches we talk to are, are are former players and current coaches and then we also get a lot of the players but for me personally mm -hmm. my i love the interest in the business side of it the organization side of it the, the teaching mm -hmm. or, or showing people how to direct events and how to create those and maybe Maybe this conversation steers towards helping some of those people who do want to see more events in their own area and what ways they can actually develop that, grow it, what steps they could take. And I know from an organizational side that you're, you're going to be a master at this. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Done one or two events in my lifetime. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one or two to put it lightly. Yeah. Um, so, Let's go. I'm going to pick a random year in the past, right? Let's sure. let's go to uh, 2002. Okay. What were you doing in volleyball and and for sports organization in, in 2002? Um, trying that was a that was a while ago. <laughs> um, I, I think <laughs> two years ago. I think I was in Virginia Beach. I think at the time running Tidewater Volleyball Association. Mm -hmm. um, I had worked for USA Volleyball. I graduated college, worked for USA Volleyball. I did a Nike Volley Van where I traveled across the country. And it was 90,000 miles, 50,000 kids, 20,000 coaches. I taught them the sport of volleyball. Um, I lived out of a van for 340 days a year. And then seven days I went to AVCA in the final four. And then I saw a mom for a week at Christmas. Um, <laughs> that was a uh, yeah, that was two years and then moved out to California, did the CBVA thing for a while, the Ventura, and then moved back to Virginia Beach area and started Tidewater Volleyball. Well, started because we're working for them, came in as a juniors coordinator. Um, and my very first day was our juniors meeting. Um, and the executive director said, hey, by the way, I put my resignation in and I'm going to suggest you become executive director's organization. Um, I was like, day I'm, one. Yeah, day one. Literally, on we I drove into town. We had breakfast in the morning, and she broke the news of the morning of um, the person who had just hired me, who I'd made friends with and planning on work with. She goes, "I'm resigning, and you're probably going to be boss." Okay, um, <laughs> so it went from it was a very big change. Um, I was very appreciative of it, but it was kind of going in and. You know, there was a lot of hurdles when you go someplace and you're new and no one knows who you are and you kind of have they're set in their ways. And the biggest thing I challenged there was that's not how we do it. That's not how we've done it in the past. Um, why do you want to do it that way? We don't do it. And then to my answer is, is why not change it? Um, just because it works doesn't mean it's the best way of doing things. If we never changed anything, we'd still be, you know, driving cars with, you know, wooden wheels or horse and yep. buggy, 
because it worked. It didn't make it, you know, cars are better and they keep moving or phones or, you know, now we can look at our watches and have conversations on our watch. So we've got to grow in advance and get bigger and better. And some people didn't like it. But the one thing I always believed in is making everything fair and equivalent. And there weren't favorites. Um, you know, people that I wound up becoming friends with, they always had the toughest draw or the toughest day, not because I was being mean to them, but because I wanted to do everything fair. So people didn't think I ever played favorites or I didn't, you know, mess with pools so that my friend has an easy pool and they get out to the playoffs or, you know, better at a TVA. We had a lot of leagues and there was issues with the schedules and, you know, you play two nights, two matches a night. And first match was six o'clock. Last match was 10 o'clock at night. So people weren't getting done until 11 o'clock at night playing indoor volleyball. And there are always weird things with schedules and with breaks and buys and different things. So I went in and changed all the schedules. And instead of assigning teams to a position, we had a captain's meeting and we drew numbers basically out of a ping pong balls out of a big PVC tube that I kind of made mm. um, like a lottery drawing type thing. Um, so I couldn't control who was playing where or what times. Right. Um, and it was really funny because there was one gentleman who was really mad at his schedule. And I said, all right, if you can make it better and fit in the same time slots that we have and your schedule works out, I'll change it. And you kind right. of, I love this response because yeah. you can complain about stuff. Mm -hmm. or you can offer solutions and yeah. man we'll always see, we see 99% 99.9% complainers with mm -hmm. zero solutions so you know yeah. a complaint is part of what's going to change something yeah. um and it needs to exist but after a while for the third time you've complained without offering any better ideas or without mm -hmm. stepping up to the plate and saying hey I'd like to be an organizer you know then sit yeah. down sit down shut up because you know, it's and, <laughs> Being part of a, a successful organizer is challenging us people to make things better, but then listening to them when they come back with something better. Mm. Don't just go, oh, no, your idea is stupid or your idea won't work or that's not better. Ladies and gentlemen, I was referring to, he came back and had a better schedule. So I said, okay, next week we're going with your schedule. He was like, what? What do you mean? I'm like, your schedule is better. We're going to go with it. You've come up with something that's perfect. I'm happy with it. You're happy with it. If anyone complains, they're going to tell them to go to you and they can yell at you because you made it. And we'll go from there. But um, Craig, aren't you inferior for accepting somebody else's good idea instead of yours? You no, know, I always, someone really smarter than me said, if you're going to be the boss, be the dumbest person in the room. Surround yourself with people that are smarter than you and better than you, and you're going to be successful. And mm -hmm. I've, always attempted to do that. I always like to surround myself with people who know more than me or know something different than me. And I let them go and do their jobs. You know, a lot of times people micromanage or I have to do this, I have to do that, don't do that. Or on the coaching levels, I see a lot of assistant coaches that aren't allowed to talk. You know, they get in their timeouts and they have a little thing, especially in the high school levels. You know, they're just there to toss balls and sometimes they don't even do that well. But yeah. they have ideas. You know, and the coach is like, no, 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 you can't do that. And I'm like, then why do you have that person there? You right. know, everyone has a different opinion and they may see something different. So go do it. And or for coaching, you know, one of the things that I did with some of the clubs I work with is we have, you know, days where once a month the entire club gets together and we work with all the kids in the entire club. We have from 12 to 18. The kids get together. We all train and all the coaches come together. But before that, all the coaches get together and say, hey, who's having an issue with a kid? So my 18s coach may say, hey, number four outside hitter, you know, Mary Smith, I can't fix her feet. Something is wrong. I don't know what it is. Would you from the 16s, you're great with outside hitters. Can you watch her this Saturday and go work with her? Love so this. Love this. One of those things where you have these coaches, especially a club or in beach, or whatever it is, you know, you have these programs with. 15 or 20 coaches, but they always get so micro focused on their team or their two kids or whatever they wind up doing. And you have a kid and especially some programs that coaches get so possessive of the kids, they coach them from 12s to 18s and they never get better. You know, they kind of had the same thing. They always hear the same words. There's nothing different coming out. Why not let the people you work with or your friends with coach kids and have them look at them and say, hey, I can't figure this out. Can you please come help? Right. Because you know, people are so afraid that that makes them look inferior or looks incapable. You know, gonna... We see this 
So I've, from a personal story, I've, I've coached, I think three different Olympians kids in volleyball mm -hmm. and like, okay, I've never gotten to go to the Olympics. They clearly know what they're talking about. But, you know, they, they kind of sit in the back of the lesson and when, you know, daughter's eyes like light up and like, oh, yeah, that works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, dad's back there rolling his eyes because he's like, I told you that a thousand times, but you yep. just need to hear it from somebody different or in a slightly different way. I mean, even my wife, I've told her a few different pieces of advice for, for passing and for defense. And then she came mm -hmm. to one of our camps and uh, I put her on JM Plummer's court and she's yeah. like, Oh, like this really works. And I'm like pulling yeah. my hair out, but you need to hear yeah. it from a different person or in a yeah. slightly different, like worded way to make it make sense. More at a different tone or to someone that's different. It, it's out there and it might be a, just a different way of explaining it where, you know, instead of saying, you know, make sure your platform is level, you say thumbs down when you pass. So yeah, now they have a new focus and they go, oh, that's how my platform gets level. That's what they've been talking about. Or, you know, rolling your shoulders, whatever it winds up being, you know, here's a different way of saying or someone's exact same thing, showing the exact same form, but the words are associated different and the kids relate to it different. So that's yep. important, you know, and the other thing I find is that coaches are so possessive, they're afraid they're going to lose kids to another club. Um, and I've always told kids, try out for every club you can, whether it's on the beach, whether it's indoors, whatever it wind up going to, go find the best fit for you. I believe I'm a really good coach. And Very they interesting. With me. You think so, that kids should try out for multiple clubs? Why, why not? I mean, what's the harm in it? If you, if you don't relate to your coach, what's the harm in going and playing for another coach that you relate to better? Why not interview yeah. them all? You're going to do it. If you, if you plan to play in college, you're going to interview and go visit, you know, different colleges. Why wouldn't you do that in a club? You're going to spend so much time with that club. You better like it. That's really like it. I've never even, heard, why haven't I even heard of people doing that? It, it's some of it is possession and some of it now is financial gains. And I understand people are in it to make money and stuff, but I'm in it for the love of the game. And I want the kids to get better. You know, when I started the high performance program in North Carolina, you know, way back in the day when I came out of USA Volleyball, we had kids coming from all over the state and training. And they said, well, why don't we make a team and play together? We're so good. We're going out and finishing second, third in high performance championships. But we're coming from all over the state of North Carolina. And that's how some of the bigger clubs were formed. But then it was, hey, let's go figure out how can we do this? How can we train with different coaches and different people? And we always told the kids, go play for whoever you want to play for. You have to learn to relate. And the other thing I see a lot of times is, especially in, in the volleyball world, unless you're going to a, you know Florida or Stanford or UCLA, you're probably going to have two coaches in your college career. You know, coaches aren't staying there for a long period of time. If you have one coach from the time you're 12 to the time you're 18, and then you only know how to relate to that person or deal with that person, you go to college and you're like, oh, this is the greatest thing. And then after you, the coach is like, peace out. I'm, I'm going someplace else. Yeah. You know, especially on beach with all the opportunities going now, there's, you know, coaches are going all over the place and, you know, they're doing what they love and trying to better themselves. You can't blame them per se, but you've got to learn to play for different people and different reactions. So go someplace that you feel comfortable and you're proud to wear, you know, those letters on your chest, whatever it winds up being. And I'm not going to be hurt if you don't play for me, as long as you're having a good experience, right. go play. That's what I've always told everybody. I don't care where you play as long as you go play. I mean, that's, that's such a good, good thing to hear. Mm -hmm. I just, I also know that as a, as a club director, people are thinking like they're losing in business if they allow a customer to kind of stray. And that's a bit of the problem, the issue that, yeah. that I kind of currently see in juniors sports is that you're losing customers, not players, no matter what you say, you yeah. know, you're treating them as, as customers. And if you treated them as players and you're like, oh, you're taking a private lesson with somebody outside the club great what did you yeah. learn from them what are they saying different you know mm -hmm. we love hearing that and in the beginning when i was running volley camp hermosa here in, in hermosa and uh, you know i heard some of our players were taking a private lesson from somebody else i was like what like we're we're not good enough like like well what yeah. the heck you know we've given you all these hours extra attention and now i'm just like cool 
you absolutely should seek out different mm -hmm. coaches. You know, there, you need to follow some sort of a, a path for a little while. You can't mm -hmm. try something for a day and say, well, that didn't work um, yeah. and, and then eject. But try different coaches because the combination of them is, is what's going to bring power. Mm -hmm. That's why college coaches and, you know, NFL, NBA have coaching staffs. Mm hmm. <laughs> because yeah. you want people to hear a, a series of things or, or, or things said in different ways. But I've, you know, I think it's real tough for, for a beach ball or any club director really to say like, yeah, you know what? Uh, go ahead, person who might potentially give me $4,000 this year. Uh, mm -hmm. See if you want to give that money to somebody else. That's, that's a tough pill to swallow, yeah. I think, for a lot of it, directors. It, it is. And a lot of the things I tell to them is, if you provide the best product with the best coaching, the best services, the best education, you're going to be full of kids and people and be looking for more coaches and people to come in. If you stay static in your coaching or static in your development, people are going to go and look for something else. That's why you're losing kids. So don't look at it as I'm losing kids or I'm losing customers. Take that as a lesson as to how to make your coaching or your club better. Fantastic so, answer. You know, and that, we, we do this okay. in sports, right? It's like, hey, don't focus on the result. Focus on the process right now. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? Is your passing getting better? Okay, you lost that match, but did you pass and set better? Like, because that was your plan this month. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of those one of those few things where you take that direct translation from sport, sport into like the business side of it or the organizational yeah. life side of it. Yeah. I mean, it's, you have to, you know, give the customers what they want. You know, if you go out to the beach and you, and you roll out some, you know, two by twos and you put them in the sand and you get a $10 net at Walmart and you have people draw lines in the sand, they're obviously probably not going to come back and play your next event when you charge them 200 bucks in an entry fee. Mm -hmm. But if you charge them a hundred dollars and you have pro nets, antennas, the nets are tight across, you have tape lines, you have music, you have ball markers, you have balls, you have everything that you need, people will come back to your event. So yes. you can go cheap and do it. And I look at it in sports, there's a lot of there's a lot of like road races or special events that come up and they see someone has a good idea. Like look at Color Run. You know, Color Run is a great thing and they had all these things. And the next year there was Color Run, there was Color Me Rad, there was Color Me Bright, Color Me different things. And everyone had a spinoff because they were trying to make it on that thing so they went into business for two years they made their money and then they realized that we didn't change anything everyone's been to a color me rat or color me race whatever it winds up being so now no one wants to do it again it's a one time how often do you want to go get covered in paint you know <laughs> you, do it, you do it once you know like it's fun then you bring your friend yeah, yeah. And you're once, like, every, once every two years would be enough for me <laughs> you know, you know that's, the, that's the thing but you know you have to evolve so you know, this, the events that are successful, they're constantly evolving or they're, you know, you look at like Tough Mudder or some of these other events that are out there, Rugged Maniac, whatever they call them now, they'll mm -hmm. change the ones that are out there, but they're constantly changing their elements. They're changing their skills that are on there. So, you know, one week it may be, you know, a straight across handlebars, you have to go down. The next time it's an angle. So it's like a roof. Sure. So there's always something different. So it's similar, but there's always going to be something new and exciting going on. It's kind of like and, the CrossFit games, right? You know, you see yeah. they, they could stick with the same physical and then just have a race. But the, just that taste of they don't know what events are going to be called until they're like at the start line, which is yeah. awesome, crazy. Uh, but at least, you know, it doesn't provide that sanity. So there is that little bit of surprise, something yeah. different. And it could be, you know, doing beach volleyball events, it may be just some swag that you're giving out. Mm -hmm. um, you have something new this year. So first year you're doing events, second year you have t-shirts with something cool on it. Third year you have a new t-shirt and, you know, just something a little bit different or you've updated your net systems or you updated your antennas or the banners or you go from the old PVC pipe with the, you know, material covering it to A-frames to you know, even having something as simple as an app to keep scoring. Um, people aren't arguing over it. So it's live streaming, you know, results are up there. So for kids, grandma and grandpa want to see scores. Um, so if you yes. have a system that's up there to keep scores, so now grandma and grandpa can see it. Or then you start adding your webcams or you're adding different streams on there. So you're always evolving so people can see. 
and you know you make it so everyone is enjoying the sport but there's always something new and even if it's you know maybe you have a center court and you have someone that can talk and they're announcing as you're doing the live stream keeping score someone putting a score on the bottom of it or you know doing something so that yeah. people are able to see what's going on you know i watch a lot of volleyball for my friends that are playing and former athletes and you see them on their you know their facebook live you know they're going facebook live or instagram or live and no one knows the score someone's inevitably walking in front of them and talking and then people are hearing rumors and they're making stuff up or something inappropriate and you're like oh no sorry grandma grandpa you know, you know <laughs> you're on the beach we know what happens yeah. <laughs> So, you know, how do you fix that? How do you make that better, especially for the kids? Um, I know. had two. I had two AVP matches taken mm -hmm. off of YouTube because two separate times at two different events, mm -hmm. uh, people were talking about some some dirty sex stuff. And yeah. like I was like, wait, what? So so I don't have a match filmed anymore? Like I didn't film my own match because I knew that yeah. it would be streaming. And AVP's like We'll give you the recording on the back end, but we can't post it. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, you know, so it happens all the time and people yeah. don't ever think about it. And it, it's, you know, like when you're doing an event and, you know, a lot of the adult players and they go for the party atmosphere and they go for the after party. And we have a lot of events that are sponsored by alcohol or, you know, whatever it winds up being. But you can't put a 12 year old or 14 year old on a court sponsored by a local alcohol company. And a lot of tournaments don't think about that. They go out there and go, okay, great. I have this seven figure sponsorship deal with ABC alcohol company. I'm um, just going to put all the nets up. But then you go put a 12 year old on it. And mom and dad are like, Hey, why are my kids playing on the alcohol court? Uh, uh, and that's something that as an event organizer, you have to think about and be careful with announcements and careful with appearances. And, you know, it's one thing if a 12 year old kid looks up to some of the pro players, but then the pro players are sitting under the tents, you know, chugging beers in the middle of the event. So now you have a 12 year old trying to be like a pro player and like, oh, they're drinking. So when I get to be that old, I can just start drinking. Sure. And, you know, so we have to help, you know, make sure that the image that we're sending is the right image, that we are professional athletes, that we are professional events. You know, we're not just a bunch of people running around in bikinis drinking beer. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's. <laughs> You know, that's what people see about it and make sure people are out there doing things. So as an event organizer or as a tournament director, as a coach, I have to be responsible to do that and give that professional appearance. Mm -hmm. um, like one of my pet peeves and now they're starting to go to it now is is when I'm coaching or I'm running an event or setting up an event. I'm always dressed shorts, shirt, hat, you know, the whole nine yards. And I see a lot of these coaches that are going out there, the younger coaches just graduated from school. They're just starting their careers, trying to make extra money. And they're young, they're attractive, and they're coaching 16-year-old girls in just shorts. They don't have a shirt on and they're out there. I understand it's hot, but that appearance is not what we want to give as professional coaches. We want to make sure that we're giving that we're a professional coach. You don't see an NFL coach in the middle of the field with the shirt off in the summer conditioning. You know, you don't see that in the gym if the AC goes out, you know, the coach is out there, you know, he's all oh, man just you know running out there. Just, you know, be professional for that hour or two you're doing it when you're playing, go and do what you want. But set that professional appearance. So if you're a tournament director, you know, have your shirt on, have things that are there. A lot of times I have a big funky hat, a lot of people have seen, and it's yes, it's keeping sun off my head, but it's also so people can find me. Because mm -hmm. how many times have you been uh, yeah, yeah tournament director and you're like where is so and so? i knew we have a need of rules interpretation yeah look for the pink flamingo yeah you know, you know <laughs> whatever it winds up being to look for the guy in the big blue hat or look for the guy in the bright yellow shirt whatever it winds up being so stand out and be professional so people know where you are and so you're available to be there when things go on because you know we go to you know events and a lot of people you know play in the double a or the a events and besides the pro events you know what's your single limb double limb the drop drop brackets are drawn out but if you're playing pool play and there's 10 sets of pools that are going on. If you finish at one o'clock, you need to know when the other pools are done because you may be early, other people may be late. And if your tournament director is off hanging out, you know, doing something, oh yeah, you people get mad. We've all been there. And it's like, why can't you stand under the tent? You know, I what mean, do you I have a, to do? A real pet peeve with, uh, you know, I, I've always said this and I'll, I'll say it again, like, you need a tournament director who's willing, willing, not is, but willing mm -hmm. to be a jerk because yeah. especially with the, 
well, th- this year it happened on the, on the AVP as well, but like a lot of the regional tournaments, the tournament director is usually friends. They see the people every weekend, mm-hmm. you know, so there's this, this little thing and they'll go and they'll say, Hey, let's get these matches. Let's get them rolling. Mm-hmm. And, and that's it. That's all the push that they'll give. And then yeah. pool play lasts until 3 PM. And then that means, you know, we're negotiating who should finish first or second at the end of the day because, yeah. uh, because there's no sunlight and it's somebody needs to be in charge at every tournament of saying you start now yeah. or you're playing to 11. You don't start in five minutes. You don't get to sign up for a month period. Yeah. You yeah, know, like everybody on this court won't get signed up, but I, I, it's tough to be a jerk. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, and it's, somebody and has to do it to keep the tournaments going because it gets harder. Honestly, as an yeah. adult, it gets harder to negotiate the rest of your life and your relationships and your kids mm-hmm. and marriage and, and boyfriends, girlfriends. When you say, yeah, I'm going to leave at 6 a.m. today. I probably won't be back till 10 p.m. because I have a fun hobby tournament. Yeah. It's like, can't this thing take seven, eight, nine hours instead of, you know, dark till dark? Yeah. I mean, that and how many times have you gone to an event where we're like, okay, first serves 8 a.m. and they don't have the captain's meeting at 30. And we've all been there. And then it's 9 15, 9 20 before the first serve is going. And then at the end of the day, it's like, oh, we're in the semis, but it's dark. Well, you know, you're waiting for players to show up or someone calls and says, oh, I didn't realize this or I didn't realize that. I'm sorry, I'm on my way. Just play other matches. Well, yeah. no, you're up. You forfeit. And a lot of people got mad at me over the years because, you know, players meeting 745, it's 745. Play starts at eight. I don't care if you're ready or not. We're playing and it's a minute a point because we got things to do. You know, I blame and, the culture for that uh, because it, it it's become so acceptable in so many different parts of the country, right? It's like, yeah. oh, yeah, players' meetings at 8. You know, we won't get started until 9.15 because people allowed that to happen. Yeah. But if, if you get one serious stern text and email saying, this is not a joke, you will yeah. lose points if you are not started by 8 a.m. Um, we're not messing around this time. Like, huh, but you know, people through. will test that and then you go yeah. hard at them once Mm -hmm. and then everybody knows for the rest of the summer and then you can actually you know be an organizer instead of somebody who puts out nets yeah and you've got to make sure that you're doing things you know doing seating correctly and doing pools fairly where you're using there's so many point systems that are out there now there's avp points there's usa volleyball points there's all these point systems and as tournament director your job is to go look at these points and seed people accordingly, not seed people because your friends get an extra better seed or someone is helping set up the tournament so they should have an easier match or two or whatever it winds up being. So bonkers to me. (laughs) It's there. And I mean, my other, my personal biggest pet peeve is when tournament directors are playing in their own events. Mm. Because if you're playing in your events and you have you're playing pro events or, you know, a small event and there's one court and you're playing, that's one thing. But when you're playing in an event and you have, you know, B, double B, A, double A juniors and those pools get done, but you're playing, who's finishing those pools? Why should the people who are paying money to play in your event have to sit around and wait because you're too busy playing? Or if you pause your match to go deal with the pools what does that tell your opponents who now have to sit around and rewarm up or stay warmed up or do whatever it is? And we see it a lot of times. It's like, if you're a professional organizer of an event, do your event. You don't have to play if you want All to right. play. I mean, I can't, I can't full, fully, you know, hundred percent agree with you there because yeah. some people need to be the organizers because they so desperately want a good place to play, you know? Yeah. So, so they see problems or they'll see a lack uh, of events and they're like, man, I want to play in good events. You know what? I'm just going to run it and they have to find a way. But I, I will say that if, if you're a tournament director or you're just, yeah. you still want to play in that tournament, you just have to assign somebody to be yeah. your, your seat at that tournament and say, Hey, you got to make sure you're running the boards. You got to make sure you're doing this. And that takes 10 bucks an hour, a college kids, you know, free entry yeah. into the tournament. Gav used to maybe still does do that up in New Jersey where yeah. they say, you know, like, Hey, if you come and you sit, so you set up all the nets in the morning before the tournament. You don't have to pay uh, oh, yeah. for the tournament. That's that's something. But to to give people a hold a cold hard line saying if you're the organizer you can't play in it. Some people in some parts of the country, they're the only person passionate enough, organized enough with the sport yeah. to actually start that. So you know you you, you should. Can- 
You can do that, but if you have that tournament director in place, you can be the organizer and the person going out there, but there needs to be someone at the desk. And if you're yeah. organized enough to have everything set out ahead of time, like when I set a tournament up, I know what's going to happen. As soon as pools go out, I'm pulling pool sheets, I'm pulling bracket sheets. I know what playoffs are going to happen and everything is laid out. So I, if I'm not there, whoever I have assisting me or helping me and go, okay, pool A, first goes here, second goes here, third goes here. As soon as everything is done, then they know exactly where to go. And if you're doing it that way, so if someone's there, you know, you can be the organizer, but not be tournament director or tournament staff. So you're oh, promoting yeah, two different, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, two different positions. That's, I'm sorry if I misspoke earlier, but that's kind of what I was getting at. You know, it needs like to be that. someone, someone there, whether even if it's a mom or a dad or you know your mom or dad, you <laughs> know, someone out there snipping another, someone out there to do it who you trust to not mess things up and not be influenced by somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, because how many times have there's been people are going out there and throwing matches for points so they get an easier bracket seat. Um, cool. <laughs> you know, you know I've seen people, yeah. you know, out there and they're like, well, hey, I have to figure out, um, you know, okay, I need, we're going by points, there's, we're seating by points. So he had 15 points. I know I can give up 14. So once I get to there, I got to score 14 points, whatever it is. I can give up so they get to those points and then they're like okay good and they're you know they're throwing matches as to yeah. what happens and to me i'm like you know that's that's not cool you know just play and deal with it it's you know i understand it people trying to do things but when you're getting that gung-ho into it it's, it's a little bit different you know craig is there anywhere where it's written down that is outside of an organization or it's for sale and if it's not Better Beach is going to make it, but <laughs> a step-by-step, -step, this is exactly how you run a tournament. Here's a list of the current, uh, the potential problems that are going to come. Here's how you sort it out. Here's what happens if you have a four-team pool tournament and there's, you know, one three-team pool and this is how you do it. Is, is there anywhere that has a booklet of the world's former problems running tournaments that offers all the solutions i don't i haven't seen one book per se we um you know it's hey it's, there, uh do you want a third job yeah there is oh fifth job yeah take that i'd be happy to make do that. A, we can make a product right. together you know it's there and you know and, and for there's lots of things that are out there like you can there's a company called bracket pal which does a lot of juniors events and you put teams in and it you tell it what you want and it spits everything out for you Okay. Um, and does everything online, which is great. But the problem is, is people don't understand why things go certain ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they don't understand why things are changed or how stuff is done or even cross pooling so that you don't play someone that you played in pool in the first round or second round of playoffs. Sure. Um, and some people go, well, we're just going to go seeds. We're going to reseed everybody at points and everyone's going to get redone and That's go through there. No. And then players yeah. hate that. And everyone hates it, but people do it because someone says that's the way to do it. But where it's everything's drawn out ahead of time. Hey, this is what we're doing. It's cross pooling. You shouldn't see anybody to us there. And it's it's good until someone loses a seed. Like we've all played in the double elimination bracket where a higher seed loses, and then you drop down to the losers bracket or challengers bracket, contenders bracket, whatever they call it now. Um, <laughs> you wind up being the same team you played earlier in the day and you lost to. And you're like, why am I playing them now in the contenders bracket? Yeah. Well, they didn't hold seed or someone did, you know, whatever it winds up being. So there's always that perfect world if everyone holds seed and you have to explain that as tournament director, this is the way we do things. Or, you know, there's been events, especially when I was running EVP, you know, we had a point system that was there and everyone came in and we attempted to seat everybody by points. But because we are traveling tour, some of our teams that traveled got a ton of points. So they were the first seed that was there. So I came up with a seeding system saying, OK, our first and second seed is going to be our EVP points, our tour, our tour series points leaders. Okay. Three and four was opened up for international players or you know someone else who's in the field okay. and then kind of going down or some different areas that were there because if i knew that my number two seed was not a very good seeded event and i could look at my seeds and go okay my number two isn't very good but i have 
you know, Phil and Todd coming in who haven't played before, they're probably the best players in the world. Right. And I look at my bracket and they go, well, Craig, why did you seed them 15? You know, they're the number two team in the world. Well, they're going to play my second seed. So they're going to take over that second seed. So I'm not killing my first seed who's loyal to the tour. Oh, wow. Now yeah. it's going in there. But that's me being interesting and attempting to make it so after the first round or second round, my seeds are where they need to be. And I pull, you know, the people that are out there that are going to be, you know, my number, you know, the best team that comes in and say, hey, you know, I understand you guys are good. Don't take your seed as a slap in the face. This is not this way. I'm fixing my tournament for that second round, you know, and it's it's different. And people come up and they yell and scream and I go, there's madness, you know, there's a method to the madness, but you've got to look past that and look through and mess things up that are different or out there just to make your event fair later in the day, you know, and a lot of times when, you know, on those traveling tours, those one or two seeds are your friends. They just play in all the events and you're like, Hey, sorry, you have to play the, sorry, the team from Brazil that came over to play today who has a silver medal in the Olympics. Sorry. <laughs> you know, exactly. they're going to be there, but I don't want to also, you know, offend my number one team on tour who travels and pays and goes all over the place and plays, you know, exclusively with us. Cause there's something to be said for that. Mm. You know, the loyalty of people going because playing beach volleyball is expensive. I mean, you know, when you're starting up, it's there's a lot of money between airfare, hotels, food, traveling play, to play beach volleyball. You know, and there's playing a lot of in itself, you know, playing, yeah. you know, traveling and getting there, you know, and yeah. there's a lot of people who pay 600, 700 bucks a weekend to travel for an airplane ticket and make 500 bucks and come home and they're like, Hey, I want to turn like, yeah, well you're down 200 bucks. I mean, you know, we've all been there. You know, you're like, how am I broke? I've won all these tournaments, you know, but you're like, well, I've, you know, plane tickets are there or you miss a plane ticket or, you know, a lot of people or younger people wind up being a bartender or waiting tables. Cause that's quick, easy money, it but, if you're, the game. but you're playing on Friday and Saturday when you're making your money. Yep. So, you know, or getting back or if you don't qualify and you still have to change your airline tickets, there's another 200 bucks or whatever it winds up being to change the airline tickets. So this is why I had a, a big problem with the with the AVP's schedule this year. You know, yeah. We just we just got another email that was like, hey, you know, we just ran the largest event series that we have uh, in the last 12 years. And yeah, they, they ran more events, but there there wasn't like more prize money no. um it was the same amount of available prize money in the country that there always has been like you can go to mm -hmm. pennsylvania take down a grass tournament every weekend and do better financially than yeah. if you took a fifth every single avp yeah you know um and they the way they're touting is that they have more events but what they what they've created is the necessity to go to lower level events because mm -hmm. of the point attribution and then you're taking the everybody who's got a job that actually pays them something, you know, mm -hmm. the three, four, maybe five days that you need to work or you need to be with family. Now, now we've almost doubled that. So you're taking away all the opportunity cost yeah. where all those other weekends used to be able to pay for mm -hmm. the other seven, like real or, or higher level events. So yeah. I disagreed and still disagree with the, with the structure that was laid out for the AVP uh, this year. I hope it's going to get fixed. They did just cancel another tournament or postpone it, uh, the, the Clearwater one in Florida, which is, yeah. Yeah, you know, everybody had the schedule. They had the Atlantic City one. They canceled that. Yep. They postponed it. Now now they're postponing Clearwater. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that Bally's is – I'm worried that Bally's is, is going to bow out um, and say maybe this wasn't such a viable purchase. Yeah, I mean, it's, and what people don't realize about like event organizers, like uh, I'll give you an example, an event in Chicago on North Avenue Beach. Mm. You know, it's a great venue. Everyone is there. What people don't realize is the permit fee is $10,000 a day. And minimum, whether right? you're, it's, I mean, that's, 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 cheap that's minimum, Chicago. you know, so it, it's there. So that's just the minimum. If you want signage, it's X amount of dollars per sign and it winds up going there. But if you're running like AVP goes in, they have set up for six or seven days beforehand. Mm. And then they have the four days of events and then, you know, three days of teardown. So that's 
almost two weeks that they're on the beach, that's $140,000 out of their pocket that they don't get back before they've done an entry fee, before they built the sands, before they paid for officials, before they did anything. And the average person doesn't realize that, you know, you run 10 events, you have a million dollars in permit fees. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, we're not, we're not, we're not yet talking about transportation no. to get sand, you know, into some parking no. lots, like the trucks that you need to bring in the people mm-hmm. that you need to actually help build the stadium. It's an expensive endeavor. Yeah, I mean, and that's just the permits. And then in some places in Florida, there's other permits you have to find out with sea turtle nest. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, a local organizer, I have to meet with the sea turtle patrol and get their clearance at six or seven o'clock in the morning before players can go on the beach. Do you we wear your ninja turtle costume just to like, you know, yeah. vibe, vibe I mean, with we, them? <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, we did an, I did an event in Naples and we built a, a, you know, out in front of this place. We had our pole set up and center court was right in front of this restaurant bar that had sponsored the event. Mm-hmm. Well, overnight a turtle came and laid its nest right in the middle of center court. <laughs> so we had to move our courts outside of this person who paid us pretty good money to be there, but we had to move everything away from the restaurant, away from the seating because a turtle put a nest there overnight. Mm-hmm. And it sounds really weird, but you know, beach people go, okay, I understand they're endangered species. We're going to move that as an organizer. I was like, are you kidding me? You know, I show up at the beach at 4.30 in the morning and I see turtle tracks and I'm like, all right, do I cover these tracks with a rake before turtle patrol season? <laughs> you know, I'm not worry about it. Yeah. Or do I do what's right and, you know, start moving nets? Um, and that's hard because the sponsor was really mad because the other people coming to his restaurant and now people have to walk down the beach 100 feet, but in front of someplace else. So, yeah. you know, those are things that we have to take into consideration that people don't realize or you know, ticketing fees or all these behind the scene things, like you said, shipping in, you know, equipment or paying for the truck drivers, you know, truck drivers are expensive in the gas and you got to put them in a hotel room, <laughs> you know, those things start to add up and the staff and the behind the scene players, you've got a lot of stuff that has to get there and things inevitably get lost. We've all dropped the keys in the sand, you know, and it disappears. Imagine having to take apart bleachers and all those little screws and nuts and bolts they fall in the sand. So you're constantly having to replenish them and they've got to be galvanized because they're expensive. Cause if you don't, they rust cause they're in the salt air all the time. So there's a lot of hidden expenses that people don't realize and it's tough to do it. So it's, you've got to to do it right, you know, and that's part of the behind the scene things that as an event organizer, I have to think about, you know, and go do, you know, and we look at the old pictures. I got a picture in my office of Manhattan beach from 1970 there's not a bleacher in sight. People are sitting on top of poles and they've kind of, you know, it's like old school, you know, there's yeah. you know, 3000 people there and they're all just surrounding center court. Um, that's not a bad thing, you know, but in today's world, people want to see the bleachers and they want to get up higher and, and yeah. do some of those Looks things. More professional. Yeah. I wonder why, why you go for that, you know, the big giant stadiums, is it because it looks more professional? So maybe like the sponsorship and the TV appearance is mm-hmm. better, but I mean, when you look at a, a surfing competition who's still got a yeah. great loyal following and big companies with lots of mm-hmm. money behind them, I mean, you see one set of bleachers. Yeah, they do set it up, but yeah. the camera never touches on these bleachers. Nope. You know, it's always on the water. So yep. you wonder, like, are we spending all of this money with the stadiums? Is it unnecessary because we're, the action that you're actually seeing it's just on the court. Yeah, you know, I, mean, I, I wonder if if they would try that one year. Like, don't build a stadium. Don't build bleachers. Have the companies bring their own tents. You know, okay, it yeah. might look less professional while you're there. Yeah. Um, but for TV appearances, do you really care that it looks professional? Or do you care that the most people have the best time and that you can actually create a sustainable yeah, I mean, and with technology, you can with TV appearances, you can put a bunch of green banners around the court, not have any logos on them, and they can get put in by TV. You know, oh, wow, there and do those things. So it's like if you if you watch an NFL game on TV or you do something else, if you're looking at the NFL field and watching the game on your phone, the colors are different that are out there. There may be a brown patch on the field, but technology has made it green, and a lot of companies will put different signage up 
where it's just it's a blank thing, but they put technology over it. Like if you watch tennis, if you ever watch a lot of tennis matches, they have different logos on the courts at different times. If you're sitting in the stands, you don't see it, but that's just superimposed on TV with technology. Cool. So can we do that for beach volleyball for TV? And, you know, awesome. or are we doing it for people walking by? And I remember when I worked for CBVA, we had to take, we had to go and basically count the number of people who walked by in a 10 minute window, multiply that by six, multiply that by eight hours for them a day. So we'd have the number of walk by impressions for our event. And, you know, are they really valuable or is it really TV market? That's something we have to decide as volleyball people. What's what makes the most sense? And are we at the point yet where it, we can use the facilities that are popping up every everywhere? Yeah. You know, we, OK, we used to have to, like, make sure that it was on beaches. And then we we're just like, all right, well, what, now we need the parking and everything. So we have to create. All right. You do have to find a place that's going to have parking. Right. That, that's yeah. got to be automatic. But uh, do we have to go to these big beaches, the big areas? Do we have to tow sand in when a lot of facilities are being built and they're planning for massive tournaments? Yeah. So maybe there's potential for all these facility owners to start running more bigger, different AVP events. And I wonder if you, if you build it with that in mind. So there's uh, Volleyball Ozark uh, mm -hmm. in, in Missouri. They built this. 10 court beautiful facility and they have they decided uh to put a giant bubble over it for the summer mm -hmm. and the winter because it's too hot and too cold uh and that facility is beautiful we're in a clinic there and it was gorgeous so high so much yeah. room so much space but they said you know we had to have enough courts so that the avp would allow us to run some major events and that was mm -hmm. important to us so for yeah. anyone thinking about those facility options think about where you might want to go and and you have to be able to plan for that so you might need some extra land you might say like well how do we fit 10 courts instead of eight because yeah. is there a minimum to run an international event or or a national like usa volleyball juniors mm -hmm. event yeah. yeah or how do you pay for that facility the other 50 weeks when the avp isn't there mm -hmm. you know how do you do that and you know we've all known the beach volleyball players are they going to pay 50 bucks an hour to come play inside or 40 bucks an hour to play inside? Or are they going to go down to the beach where it's free? Right. And because you have to, you know, the best way I can tell people to think about it is if you have an indoor facility, when you get home from the beach and you jump in the shower, the bottom of your shower is full of sand. When yeah. you run an indoor facility, all that sand is going home from your facility. So you now have to replenish that sand sure. and that gets super expensive. Plus, you have to water it down or else it gets dusty. So then your water bill is high and everyone's using the restrooms or washing their hands, the air conditioning or the heating. There's a lot of expense that people don't realize that goes into like, it's just sand in a building. How hard can it be? Mm -mm. Um, you know, if you don't have- and Everybody drinking, snooze you in 30 years because there's dust yeah. in their lungs from spending five days a week in your facility. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and, something and they're trying to, to pay 20 bucks an hour, 25 bucks an hour to play or as an event organizer, and, and when I ran Tywater Volleyball, a lot of people got upset because I'd run fours and sixes leagues a lot of time on the sand simply because I can make money on the sand. Two's people, they're not going to, you know, they're paying 20 bucks a person. So if anyone pays 20 bucks a person, that's 40 bucks for doubles. But now I'm making 120 bucks on the sixes team. That. Yep. So, and people are playing, and it may not be the prettiest volleyball, but as an organizer, I have lights to, on. to you know get the lights on. I'm sorry and do different things, but this it's, you is know, something like, that that uh, twos players, beach volleyball players, and uh, and open level players yeah. never understand that the mm -hmm. rest of the tournament, everybody else there, mm -hmm. subsidizes you. Yep. Most open levels, open tournaments. You're just there for show. You are the smallest collection of players. Like to be at that mm -hmm. level, the highest level, it's usually the smallest collection of players, yeah. or you know what we call like bottom of the funnel, basically, um, <laughs> or top of the food chain. But yeah. but there's there can only be a, f a few small people that exist at that level. And you say you want more money. You say you want this. And hey, you don't pay for this. No. Every B. A double A player where you see much a much larger field because it's more inviting and mm -hmm. they don't beg for a five thousand dollar paycheck 
right? They're stoked yeah. to take home uh, yeah, a, a beach chair and an umbrella. But yeah. open players need to hear this again and again and again. Like, hey, it's not about you. And I think tournament organizers, I actually talked to somebody in the Northeast and he was like, you know, how do I get bigger players to my tournaments? How do I, mm -hmm. how do I create more prestige? And I go, if you want to make it sustainable, ignore that completely. Don't invite big names. Don't try mm -hmm. to push and collect money to, to give it away to an open player. Instead, make the event so fantastic and enjoyable mm -hmm. for everybody else that they'll keep coming back. So if yeah. you if you were to focus specifically just on like making money uh, or making a sustainable event, honestly, the first thing to go would be the open level yeah. because they're pickier, they're greedier, you know, they expect more and you're, and you have to give them money. And it's, uh, so I told that tournament organizer, I go, don't try to pull in any pros. Don't bother with that. I go, take that money that you would pay them, pay for mm -hmm. the DJ, right? Yeah. Pay, pay for like better shirts that people are going to wear at the bar instead of just wiping yeah. their sweat with and never wearing again. Um, there are ways there's to a, do it. There's a, one of the things I think you'll appreciate is someone told me a long time ago in, in sports marketing, there's great money in bad sports. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You know, which sounds really weird, but it, it, you know, you run a like you run a juniors tournament. If you run it at the elite level, those teams always travel. They know what's going on. They're not buying T-shirts. They're not buying merchandise. They're not going out. They they're kind of in a rhythm. But if you run it for a lower level tournament, those teams that are coming in, this is their one event they play all year. This is their one big tournament they're going to, or two big tournaments they go into. They're gonna buy an event shirt, whether it's fifteen or twenty bucks. Yep. They're gonna buy merchandise. They're gonna take pictures and put it on social media. They're gonna spread the word, and they're gonna come back. So, you know, you put those events on, and you cater to them and treat them great. You know, they're gonna come back. You know, when I run my events and I run juniors, you know. When I was doing events in my in Hampton, Virginia and Virginia Beach, we did, you know, men's and women's on Saturday, but Sunday we did co-as fours and juniors. But my juniors, I always kept my center court open towards the end of the day and my 12s, my 14s, my 16s, my 18s, their finals, we put on center court. Great. So, and we announced their matches and some of them were scared out of their minds when they hear their name for the first time or, you know, like a big kill, you know, a hey, serve, you know, blah, blah. And, they loved it and got used to it. And that's why they fought to come back was say, Hey, if we win, we can play on center court where the pros played the day before this. I, I had this exact conversation this summer because at every, uh, AVP tour stop, I forget the, the tears, uh, but every, every AVP, I think it's tour stop. Uh, you had these giant juniors event. So in Atlantic city, you had it. Um, I think in Virginia beach, they had it. And there's, there's one more place where I was like, where are all the juniors going? Because their tournament, their massive tournament, yeah. finished before the, the pros got there. And so their parents, who got real jobs and actually have to pay yep. for stuff and don't want to pay $400 a night, yeah. so they leave. So yep. all, you brought all the kids there, you know, our future fan base mm -hmm. and it should be current fan base. And then you, you, designed, you designed everything so that they're gone when the pro event starts. Yeah. In my mind, I was like, hey, what if you – what if you guaranteed that the the champions, like you're saying, yeah. they played the first set of mm -hmm. their championship on center court in between yeah. some pro matches. Now the kids stay. Now their yep. parents stay. Now like maybe they get on that giant live stream that the AVP mm -hmm. is hosting. And the shareability of all of that could be massive. Yep. But instead they were they were leaving. And then the pros were showing up. And so there was no interaction. Like literally people were running to the airport and they would come over like, Mark, your YouTube channel. Like, hi, Mark, can we get a picture? And I was like, aren't you staying for the tournament? They said, no, we just finished four days of volleyball. I was like, yeah. Oh, bye. I mean, one, <laughs> of the, one of the great things I think that golf does, which, you know, I think we can learn a lot from, from golf and sports is similar in the way their athletes are treated and, you know, individual stuff. But golf does, you know, they do pro days beforehand or, you know, you pay X amount of dollars and you get to play a round of golf with the pro. So there's three people, a corporate sponsor playing with tiger, playing with Phil, playing with one of the pro players. And one of the things that we did back on, on EVP, we, we did a corporate challenge. So yeah. the Friday before we set up, you probably remember, you know, seeing or hearing about it, but it was, we had corporate teams come out and they sponsored paid X amount of dollars, but they got to play with one of our pros. 
and we kind of handpicked some of our pros who were friendly, who were nice, who weren't didn't think they were better than everybody else. weren't I can't be bothered with that. Yeah, the I'm, personality guys, yeah, you yeah. know the personality people, and those people love playing with the pros. Had fun, you know. We got on, we announced, we had a good time. But the next day, all those people that played in the corporate challenge came back and watched the pros. And the people pros were like, hey, thanks for coming out. These are my partners from yesterday. You know, they gave them hugs or high fives, depending, you know, whatever that was, yep. when they went up and they talked to their friends and they went and interacted with the people. And a lot of times you see pro athletes who are not, especially, you know, the ones that think they're pros, they don't talk to the average person walking down the street. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't go do those things or they don't know who those people are. Like I can tell you a, a great story. It's one of my favorite ones. I worked at a club. My club director loved Karch Karai. She said, if he ever becomes single, I will marry him. He, <laughs> you know, he thought he was the greatest thing. And we went to NCAAs and we were, you know, coaching clubs. So we went together, we're doing the AVCA thing. And Karch comes walking down the street. And I've known him for working with USA Volleyball. And he's like, hey, Craig, I'm like, hey, how you doing? And I knew that our club director loved him. And she was just looking at it, and she had no clue that that was Karch Cry. He <laughs> in street clothes, and we're just talking, and blah blah. And hey, I'll see you that later. Wasn't she wasn't wearing a pink hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so she goes, "Who is that guy? You didn't introduce me." And I'm like, "Well, I thought you knew who it was." She was like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "Well, that was Karch." She goes, "No, it wasn't." And I'm like, "Come on, we're going inside the gym to watch practice. He's going to be down on the court." So we went inside, and sure enough, there it was. And she lost her mind. You know, oh my god, that was Karch. I met him, and I was like. Well, yeah, we don't know, you know, we don't know who the players are outside of seeing them on the court. You know, you see them, you know, you see some of the players, you're like, oh, wow, they're tall. But, you know, if you see, you know, Brooke Sweat, who's an Olympian, she's five, six, five, eight, looks like an average person walking down the street. She doesn't look like a volleyball player. Mm -hmm. Or you see something like the Lindquist sisters back in the day, you know, who are playing, you know, anybody. they're, I mean, really, you know, anybody. Anybody. like there's anybody a few people that, that are kind of unmistakable, like, but even, you know, Phil. Like if yeah. he's walking down the street, it's not like people are, are stopping him and waving him down. He's like, oh, yeah. there's, a, there's a tall, bald guy. I mean, it's you know, <laughs> Lloyd, I've been a lot of events with, with Lloyd Ball and we'll be out at night and we'll be at a restaurant and people won't know who he is. They're like, who's that really tall guy? I'm like, probably the greatest setter to ever play four time Olympian. They're like, right. he's not Olympian. I'm like, yes, he, he is. <laughs> you yep. know, we can do it. But, you know, that's part of our issue is some of our greatest athletes, people don't know who they are. You know, they can't figure out who is the best player, who is the people they're rolling to and, be, you know, which we can do a better job of, I think, as volleyball people and promoters and doing meeting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're micro famous in our own little world, you know, yeah. but it's, you know, you have one of the greatest players to ever play the game and no one knows who yeah. it is, you know, even different people, indoor players. And I ask my kids now I coach when I coach indoor, I'm like, hey, who's the Name someone who's an Olympic indoor volleyball player. Thank you. That and needs to happen. There needs to be a hero, somebody to look yeah. up to if you're going to emulate or or grow in the sport, like somebody who you're going to watch and study and learn from. Yeah. That every yeah. club coach in the entire country, if not world, should be making that mandatory. Like you yeah. need to pick a favorite player and watch them and go like watch three of their matches and come tell me what they did so well. But you know, they, even on even on the guy the names. Yeah. on the guy side, you know, like who's the head coach of the men's national team? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, name one of the players. Uh, you know, Gabby Reese. No, she's been retired for years, twenty years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's who they know. Oh, the girls that are in the Visa commercial. You know, when Carrie and Missy were in the mm -hmm. Visa commercial. So that's kind of, you know, they know that, but they don't know who they are. And I'm like, yeah. you're our club players. You're the better players, and you don't know who the people you should be looking up to are, you know, that's a problem. Hey, um, I want to be, before I run out of time with you, because yeah. I, I, I want to basically get a, a course from you while we're on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I think this would be super valuable for a very small section of our, of the people who are listening, but I'd like to go with you and, and see if we can explore from ground zero running an event. Okay. So let's say that I, want to start a two a two on two volleyball tournament mm -hmm. if i'm starting from zero i love volleyball there's some beaches some some sand courts around me at different parks whatever if you could take me through a, a like a step by step and i'll i'll ask some annoying questions um but i i think 
I think if we equip people with this and kind of demystify some of this, that this episode has a potential to really help grow the sport, you know, exponentially yeah. because people will actually, they won't, they'll look at the steps. They'll say, oh, I could do this step by step. And, and there'll be a little less fear because when you think about an event and you think about 200 nets set up and 800 people signing up and websites and, and all that, all yep. of a sudden you get freaked out and you don't even take a single step forward. Mm -hmm. So maybe if we can go through a couple beginner steps, like, like a, a, how, how to create a volleyball tournament for beginners. Yeah. Um, that the, what, would, what would their first step be if they have some volleyball friends, they like volleyball and yeah. let's just say that there's some sand courts, maybe in a park or, or, or there's a beach near them. Yeah. I mean, the first thing would be is find a location. If it's at a beach or at a park, you know, you find a location, do your homework and figure out what it takes to use that space. Um, and I mean, use that space legally, um, it, which is which difficult because you go to a park and you're like, oh, we can have a go tournament there. Well, no, you have to have a permit. You have to do this. You have to do that. So, okay. you know, figure out where you want to go. So if you want to go to a park, you know, and have an event, reach out to the parks and rec department and say, hey, listen, I'm thinking about doing an event at your park what permits or fees or what do I need to do to be able to use your courts and reserve them for the day that's I'm thinking about doing it. And then so, there's usually a, a website, right? So like if I'm in uh, Timbuktu, Ireland, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to look at Timbuktu parks and recreation yeah. and Google that and, and try to find a, a permit number or yeah, permit call or any phone number because it's the office. Yeah. Like don't, don't be shy yeah. about calling a number and them saying, yeah. Oh no, but let me transfer you. Yeah, call the number and like if, if where I you know I work when you know in my current parks and rec job, I get calls all the time for people wanting to do things. So and I tell people I'm happy to help you make these things happen, but you have there's certain steps you have to do um, to do it. And so first one is find location. And then second one is check the calendar and see what else is going on. Because if you want to have an event, but there's five other beach volleyball tournaments within 30 minutes of your event you're diluting the pool of people, potential players. So yeah. check the calendar, see what's going on. And then once you do it, then you figure out what it's going to be and start planning for it ahead of time. What do you need? Do you need nets? Do you need lines? Do you need antennas? Do you need volleyballs? Or are you, you going to make a good people? time runway? Like um, how far, how much should I definitely give myself uh or, or maybe what's the minimum amount of time that you think you would need to, to really get things in, in place? To, to do it right at least two months. Okay. Um, some places take 60 days before at, before permits are even looked at or reviewed in some cities and places. Hermosa um, doesn't do it. Uh, it I, think it's, I think it's a full year. Like you have, yeah, to, you have to reserve court time a full year in advance. Full year, I think Chicago. There's one day in November you have to wait in line, and it's just first come first serve. So people are <laughs> waiting in line in snow and saying, "I've been in that line. It's awful. Uh, it's yeah. raining and cold, and you're waiting in line to get in and get your spot on North Avenue Beach." So okay. it, it's there. Um, so figure out you know what it takes to do that. Find your date, and then the best thing to do you know get the word out that's there and figure out what you're going to run. Are you going to run doubles? Are you going to run fours? Are you going to run adults? Are you going to run juniors? What what do you want to do at this event? What do you want to accomplish? Is this a fun fours tournament? Is it a serious twos? You know, how are you going to do it? Is it going to be pool play? Is it going to be double elimination? Is it going to be single elimination and coming up with those formats for it's going to be there? Because what that's going to do is if you have a location in a format, that can give you your maximum number of teams you can have at your event. Well, so Challenge I'll ask this, should we, yeah. should I get as many people as I can or should I, I mean, I know the answer for, for our company. Like we set hard numbers because I don't want to, for me, I don't want to deal like for our camps right now, we set it at a max of 60. Are we going to grow mm -hmm. beyond that? Yes, we will. But, um, 60 says, all right, we need 10 coaches. Mm -hmm. Done. All right. At least now the hiring part of that is taken care of. I, I know how much stuff I need instead of if you leave it open, 20 people sign up the last day and you're like, shoot, now I'm negative three or four coaches or you're negative three yep. or four nets. To me, I think it's important to set the format and to say, 
we're only allowing this many spots. But yeah. uh, what do you, I mean, I'm, you have I'm a, a firm experience. believer on, no, I'm a firm believer on the, you set your format and you limit it to that number of teams. Um, I personally don't want to play or run a five team pool any place because they take forever. Okay. Um, so I'm limiting at, you know, I'll do a four team pool or I'll do a six team pool, but a six team pool is going to be two, three team pools kind of going back and forth. So I can get six teams on a court in the same space a four team pool will go is because they both wind up taking six hours. Okay. So it's that time frame to do it. So depending upon it, this is kind of weird, but that's my tournament director mind going out there. So how can we do that? So if I have, if I have two nets, I know I only want to take eight teams. That's my number of teams. I'm going to set the max X. That's two, 14 pools. Okay, and then so I'll have think a, four teams per net. Like that's how we should be thinking. Yeah. Because that's what like, I what if, if you're, if you're sitting there and, and you've got a park, you know that like your local park has two courts. Mm -hmm. Am I really going to try to run just an eight? team event is there any way to squeeze more into that you can you can do an event you can get if you have two courts you can run 12 teams okay. um four three team pools and you kind of get done that same amount of time okay. so you have so you do a pool so on one court is pool a and b the other courts c and d mm -hmm. so pool a plays so one plays two three refs and then pool b comes and plays one plays two three refs so either you're playing off play off it makes it for sometimes a longer you know you have some downtime Okay. But it's a little bit weird. If you think about think about two three team pools and it was kind of switching back and forth. It's still right. a three team pool is three hours, a four team pool is six hours. So it kind of works out that way. Okay, so um, we're thinking maximum twelve six teams. six teams per court. Yeah, if you're if you're considering a, a twos tournament. Yeah, six, a double even four, even fours. Yeah, fours or six. whatever you want to do. Six is you can do it. That's the maximum you could be. Um, I would avoid 10 teams because that's just an ugly number. Um, but you can do a three, three, and four. That gives you that six in that way. But most people just go five and five because that's easier in their mind. Okay. Um, but I'm a little, I think what's better for the players. Sure. Um, and then, you know, with then your format. So here's my format, what I'm going to do, my maximum number of teams. And then what level do I want it to be? Because uh, set the level. Okay. Set the level because that's one thing that people have to do. If you have one team that's really good, you know, if you and your guys go play and the other nine teams are people have never played before it's church groups it's my friends that were just started playing people won't come back to your tournament if they're way out of their league yeah. either way so, up or you down. know and promote it that way here's what it is and whether we have to we let some better teams in we'll play pool but then we pull them out for playoffs because yeah. people want to go from there so you have your format your and then go publicize it and get it out How? um just social media, word of mouth, your friends, social media is kind of the way of doing things. Um, one thing I like to do is if you're able to use, the, if there's courts that are up there, nets that are up there and it's at a park and rec, ask them if you can promote your tournament by going and putting a tournament flyer, stapling it to the wooden post that's out there. So go I laminate just, it and say, hey, you know, old school, people, you play, your people are playing are your customers. So why not put it in front of them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm also going to add like very specific. So from social media and, and sales and business standpoint, yeah. people think that they announce something once and they get crickets back. Ah, nobody wants it. No. But from, from sales, uh, like recognition of a brand and then the comfort of actually signing up for something with them, not, e not even buying, but signing up for something with them, yeah. you need at minimum seven touches they need to see you seven different times yeah. minimum before mm -hmm. they get anything and there are some some studies that are like seven to 15 times so i mean if you're gonna have a tournament do not be shy with social media the way yeah. the algorithms are you're not gonna lose followers or lose friends or annoy people trust me there's enough yeah. traffic out there post three times a day copy paste post copy yeah. paste post and then i think ask people to share but i'll also say yeah. See, talk to the club directors, like research mm -hmm. juniors clubs in your area and say, hey, I'm running in adults or I'm running this age or this level tournament. Do mm -hmm. you know of anybody who plays? Could I put a flyer up at your place? Yeah. I mean, oh. just word of mouth and getting out there and knowing people. If you're in and you want to do it, you know, that's and part of it is meeting people and going to them and making it easier for them to help promote your event. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of tournaments where people come and they send it to me and they're like, hey, can you put this flyer up? 
I don't know who you are and I'm not going to print it out and I'm not going to put it up because I don't know who you are. But if you come to me and say, you know, say, hey, listen, you know, I'm so and so and I'm running this event and here's some flyers and this is what we're going to do. Would you mind helping me? I'm more likely to help you than the person who sends me something. Hey, promote this on your page. Right. You know, and that, that's me personally, but that's just kind of how I am. I'm big on personal yeah. interaction with things. You walk up to somebody at a bar and you're like, hey, you want to go home with me? Like, yeah. whoa. <laughs> who, who no, you know, you're going to get a glass yeah. thrown in your face. So. You, know, so, you know, and get it out there and, and word of mouth, get people talking about it and get people out there. The other thing is, is you have to get somebody to sign up. No one wants to be the first team to sign up. Because you're a tournament director, you get a lot of calls. Well, who's playing? How many teams have already signed up? So get some of your friends to sign up and put that information out there so that it looks like there's teams that are on there. As people come uh, in because they see more teams. The old line outside the club technique. Uh, you know, it's <laughs> kind of there. So it, it's there. It's that idea. But, you know, don't make up names. Don't put your kids' names on there or your friends' place who aren't and then swap them out as team goes on because people are going to catch on. Yeah. They're going to go, oh, look, there's Matt and John. They seem to play in every tournament, but I don't know who they are. Um, you know, and <laughs> <go from there. laughs> you know, so it's kind of that way. So, you know, get some of the people that you know want to play, get them to sign up. And maybe if it's the first time, say, hey, listen, you guys are willing to play in this tournament. I need you guys to register, and I'm not going to charge you if you register this first time. because This is what early bird discounts do as well. Yeah. You know, 100%. if you get early people to sign up way in advance, you give them mm -hmm. a steep or even some kind of discount or reward, like, hey, first yeah. first four people to sign up, get a ball. Yeah, you're going to mm -hmm. maybe lose on those four yeah. teams, but you'll actually get your event running. Yeah. And that's more important, right? And my and my thing is, is I'm a little different than most people on that. I believe in building for the future. I believe that if I can break even or lose just a little bit where I'm not, you know, killing myself or being homeless or sleeping in the car again, <laughs> you know, I can continue to grow things. And as if I do things right and treat my customers well, my events are going to grow and I'm going to make my money off of them. I think that's um, a good way to, to talk to somebody kind of like the average person. Like, hey, if you were to throw a party or you threw a barbecue, you know, I think – different parties in different parts of the country are, are a little bit different, but I always lose money uh, when mm -hmm. I, when I throw a party, but you don't lose money. It's I'm comfortable saying, you know what? I'm going to have an awesome time with my friends and family. So mm -hmm. I'm going to buy this and this is how much I'm going to. And in the end, so many people come and help you anyway, yep. that like they, they leave, you know, they leave their three quarters of, of bottle <laughs> of vodka and they leave yeah. their ex extra ZD and you're like, Oh, well, now I'm out on top because I just paid for a week of eating <laughs> with all my yeah, left week of eating or that, that vodka that's left behind is now the seed for my next party. So yes. I don't have to buy as much. So that's kind of, you know, the volleyball tournament is if you do it right now, you have the seed planted. People want to come back mm -hmm. and people are going to be there. So you've got to do the things right and, and don't take shortcuts. Okay. That's, that's the other thing. The, the other thing from my side, from my event side of things, because I've done things besides volleyball, I've done big races and, you know, road races and all kinds of things across the country. You need to make sure that you have some sort of LLC or business entity established when you're doing these things. So because, should, have this, should this have come before? Find well, a location I, would before or... I would do it beforehand. If I'm going to be running a tournament, I would have it established. You have to. Um, you don't have to. No, you don't have to. But what winds up happening is, is, Someone comes to your event mm -hmm. and they trip over one of your boundary lines and break an ankle. Mm. They can sue you for some reason for the sand not being flat, the sun being in their eyes, them falling down. Okay. And they can go after your house, your car, your finances, because you're the person in charge. If yeah. you have an LLC, spend a couple hundred bucks to make that LLC and run everything through the LLC. Yes, it's a little bit more, but... Now they can't come after your personal stuff. Okay, um, and an LLC, you can. It can be two to three hundred bucks. I'll, I'll just. We don't get any, you know, because yeah. this conversation went wild, um, which I'm excited <laughs> about. Um, but if you guys go to Legal Zoom, that's, yep. that's I, I've built three different uh, escorts or LLCs on yep. Legal Zoom. It's an easy process. It'll probably take you about eight days to have mm -hmm. a legit business entity set yep. up, and then it's free to open up a bank account, and then some banks yep. even pay you. To open a bank account with them, yep. uh, you get like a five hundred dollar bonus for saying, you know, yeah. bring this. So, get that LLC, get that S corp, 
Some yeah. counties, is your county like this, where they give significantly uh, less expensive permit fees to nonprofits? Yes, 100%. We actually have for our county. They actually, if you fill out paperwork, we actually can do a nonprofit waiver, um, so we can get fees wiped off for some of our nonprofits. So there's it's zero cost to use the facilities. Wow. Particularly, particularly if you're aiming towards the residents of that area and providing a service for the residents in the parks. Okay. Um, or working with the tour. If you're vending, if your event's growing, work with the tourism office to have them help bring in or find some grant money for some of your bigger events that are coming out there. Uh, um, and, uh, so that happened with us as well. We could have, if we had a nonprofit, we could definitely save yeah. in a lot of areas, but we plan on maybe it's someday being able to, mm -hmm. to sell a, the company. Um, yeah. So we might develop a nonprofit arm that throws tournaments. And then yep. uh, I have a big belief in, in uh, uh, big brothers and sisters. Um, mm -hmm mentorship style yeah. charities so yeah. that can feed that but i th i think it's it's a lot more paperwork and it is. you and you actually have to have a legit vision like and if your vision is nonprofit mm -hmm. that grows volleyball in this area because it increases health it increases physical mm -hmm. fitness you know you're creating a, a fun place for people to go outside exercise that's enough for the yep. government to say yep that is a that is a great mission go for it and you can also have, you can have, depending upon where you live, you can have a local nonprofit, a state nonprofit, or a federal nonprofit. Oh. So those are also different things that are out there, which I've learned through the years that they exist. I didn't know they existed for a long time, okay. but you can look into that. And some of it is nonprofit, but you pay tax. Some of it is you don't pay tax depending upon where it is um, and where you're going on. If you're a state nonprofit and you go outside of your state, you have to pay tax, but not in the state you're registered in. Federal nonprofits is a little different yeah. depending upon the areas. And remember, but, a nonprofit can still pay its employees as much as they yep. want, can still pay its CEO as much as they mm -hmm. want. Um, you just probably can't sell it on the back end or, or yeah. publicly trade it or anything like that. There's that and there's rules with nonprofit as far as your board members and having to have an established board of people. You still need some of that with LLCs, but your LLC can be you and like two, you know, you can be a couple different positions on it, or you can yeah. be an S corp and you don't have to worry about it, but a nonprofit, you actually have to do that and file paperwork. E each state is a little different, but For just sure. a little more work. Super um, expensive in California. It's like 800, yeah. 400 <laughs> bucks, but um, just, it's crazy. Yeah. But, uh, the other thing and LLC, is, I'll say is probably the easiest and fastest thing to set up, that. but yeah. non-for-profit might save you the most money and give you the most advantage over, mm -hmm. over time. 100%. The other thing is, is that anytime I do an event, I always have insurance. And a lot of places you have to have liability insurance to even get the permit or get out there and do the things that you need to do. And that's just a background. And, you know, I'll give you an issue, an example. There was an issue with one of my friends who, who runs a facility and someone fell in their facility and hurt themselves just randomly. So they got sued and they were running like they were running an event there. But the lawyers didn't want to know anything about the building. They wanted to know the name of the insurance company and the maximum amount of coverage they had. That's what the yep. request was from the, from the insurance, from the lawyers. So if you don't have that, you know, the insurance, you, if you get sued and someone's going after you for a million dollars and you don't have the insurance, you're SOL. I mean, you're yeah. going to be in trouble and it's going to cause you issues down the road because you're trying to do something or it may not be your players. It may be the person walking by who trips over a volleyball down the pathway. Um, so I'll say for this, for the, for the new people, if you're, you know, watching this and you're like taking these notes and you're saying, <laughs> all right, well, I got to go through legal. Like I got to get a company. I got to get a bank account. The developing a company can literally take you less than an hour. If you do it through, through legal zoom, right? You mm -hmm. just need a name uh, and they'll, they'll handle all of that for you. Yep. Getting insurance we work with, I think it's L. Dean Associates. They do sports camps, sports mm -hmm. events, tournaments all across the country. They're nationwide. And you fill out one piece of paper. It'll probably take you 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, but it says, where are you running? Who are the insured parties? And then it says, how many people do you expect to be there? And what ages and what activities? Yep. And then they email you back with, all right, volleyball is a low injury activity. So here's your rates. If you were like sending people into the air, like cheerleading, yep. it would be significantly higher. Um, 
but that in itself, you know, it'll take you like a half hour to fill out the form, but your total time talking to that insurance company to get that plan, total time invested, I'll say maybe two and a half hours if you just yeah. call them right away. Do you have any recommended insurance companies that you know have done a good job? There's a bunch in there. I mean, you can go online and unfortunately there are a dime a dozen, you're going to get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people use the USA Volleyball Insurance or AAU Insurance if you're a membership, but then you people have to be members or even AVP, you can use AVP memberships and get your insurance for the events, but then everyone has to get memberships. So you can and kind that's of- that's another difficult step, which prevents sure. signups. I think yep. that's I think that's not your first time. I think you no. wait. Uh, yeah, I mean, as, as it goes, unless you know, unless everyone, unless you're doing a tournament for juniors and it's all your kids' friends and they're all playing the same club program together mm -hmm. and you have that or juniors or adults or whatever it winds up being, but it, it's, you can get insurance for a hundred bucks, 150 bucks up to yeah. more than that for your event. So it's not that big of a deal. Or if you know someone or call your homeowner's insurance or whoever you have, they may have an umbrella liability policy. Yeah. Um, and doesn't oh. hurt to because I've right. done that before with one of my insurance companies. So, hey, I'm doing an event. Can you help point me in the right direction? I have my car insurance, my homeowner's insurance through you, you know, all these things through you. Can you help me? And they're like, yeah, not a problem. Done. Oh, smart. Good. Bundled. It was there. Um, doesn't You don't know unless you ask. That's always my okay. <laughs> go-to thing. Cool. Um, but don't, but get, so don't have, get intimidated by like the insurance yeah. thing. Like it's going to take a no. phone call, guys, and it's going to take you filling out one page of information about how many people you expect to be there Yeah, and it the activity. So it's... Uh, you can move on that and you, and you can get that done, like I said, in max two hours of time investment. Yeah, if 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 you're going slow and reading everything carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a careful reader. I, I don't can, like them getting away with stuff. Yeah. You can uh, fly through the pages in 15 minutes online and get insurance uh, <laughs> if you fill it out. But it's, um, you know, so you do that. But then, you know, I'm fortunate that I have all my brackets and pool plays and pool sheets and everything already done and figured out ahead of time. But you know, there's all that stuff is online, how to, how to run a tournament. You can look in the USA volleyball rule book and it has the brackets that are in there. So there's 14 pools, three team pools and seeds and everything that's on there. So there is a place for how to just or, you can like, organize different stuff. Yep. numbers of brackets tournaments. And yep. that's on so the USA there, volleyball website. I believe that's on the USA volleyball rule book. It used to be in the rule book um, for information that was on there. Um, and there's plenty of other places you can Google you know, you can Google pool information. Um, I, I hate telling people to Google too often because then it turns into 30 different links and then they oh. have to read through 10 paragraphs before they get even the answer because yeah. SEO. Um, yeah, I, I get it. I'm just, it's yeah, yeah. there. Or ask someone, if you know someone like me, I'll give you my pool sheets. Cool. <laughs> you know, just because I just, here, here you go. it's not a sneaker, you know, one place, two, three refs, three place, four, one, you know, and just kind of go through it. Um, but there's, hundred different ways to run pools. Anybody has been to a tournament, you know, and I heard the other day, they were like, Oh, you're running an indoor pool on the beach. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, pool, like, yeah. indoor pool versus outdoor pool. Um, you know, it's because one versus two is the first one, but you know, it's like, whatever, just get over it, people. Uh, just go play. Um, but it's just kind of there. So it's, you can do that. But you know, the other advice I give people is if you think it's going to take some, whatever amount of time you're going to give yourself to set up the event, double that amount of time that you think minimum double at least minimum. Because you're gonna get out there and something is going to break uh, you're going to have an eyeball that's going to be missing a hook or something yep. is going to be there so you need at least that amount of time to set up and be prepared um or and, i mean if if you've never set up like a parkinson net mm -hmm. let's say go like walk to like to drive to the place where you're driving to from your car Mm -hmm. set a stopwatch go and set up one net and then set up your tent way in mm -hmm. advance you know yep. and say okay how long did that actually take me now how many nets am i going to need uh mm -hmm. etc like but that stopwatch of knowing that and then say also there's going to be a problem because something's going to break so like mm -hmm. you said I think double that stopwatch time for for day of tournament that or what happens if it's thundering and lightning when i'm going to set up Mm, oh yeah. If you live on the East Coast, you know California, they don't have a whole lot of lightning storms. No, Florida, it gets windy great, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Florida, three o'clock in the afternoon, you're dodging lightning all day. Uh, oh. You know, so you have to schedule your times to do it, or you know, plan and look at the weather, see what it's calling for, and schedule your time ahead of it. Mm -hmm. um, 
And my other big thing with me is I'll get to the beach at three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning to set up. Um, so I know everything. I'd much rather be sitting under my tent, you know, drinking my Red Bull, waiting for people to show up yep. as opposed to be scrambling, trying to figure out last things as people are registering. Parents are wanting to know what court they play on. So I want to be done and waiting for people not running around like a chicken with my head cut off. If you don't need a flashlight when you show up, uh, yeah. you are there too late to be a tournament yeah. organizer director. <laughs> you have to. The other thing is like on the East Coast, there's if in Florida and like from North Carolina South, you can't have a white flashlight on the beach during turtle nesting season. Oh my God. That's actually yeah, yeah. against law because you could turtle see the white light. I think it's, I think the, it's moon, the moon. The wrong yeah. direction. So in some places you have piping plovers. They have a different color. So I my headlamp has a red, a green, a blue, and a white. So that depending upon what beach I'm on, it's funny. I'm legal and don't have the EPA or DEP coming after me no. because I've been around and did that. Because the last thing you want to do is that you have a white headlamp and someone calls the police because they see a headlamp and the deputy comes over and says, hey, you can't be setting up with the headlamp. And now you're going in the dark or, you know, you have birds that are coming at you or you're waking things, whatever it winds up being. So do your what you can and can't do. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is do a trial run if it's your first time being there. Because if you're going to a park, is there a gate or a lock you have to get through at four o'clock in the morning to set up? Because a lot of parks close. Or is the beach parking lot closed and there's a Ooh. chain across the gate that you never thought about? What an important question. Oh, so my goodness. That's something to do. So go the weekend before yeah. at four we're o'clock in the park. Morning. We don't open till 7 a.m. Like, yeah. what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a chain across or yep. something as simple as, you know, talking to the park about what time do the restrooms open? Because mm -hmm. if you're out there at four o'clock in the morning, you, you have your coffee or two or eight, depending on who you are. or You have a couple of Red Bulls. <laughs> yeah. It's now six o'clock and you're looking around and, and you have to get rid of your coffee or Red Bulls and the bathrooms are locked. Yeah. What do you do? Um, you know, things along those lines, because that that's an awful hour waiting <laughs> you know, yep. to, to do that on the beach. Or it, when I ran in Virginia Beach, we didn't have restrooms that were there. There were businesses, but every block had a porta potty that was there. So one of my mainstays in my tournament bag was a, basically a case of toilet paper, which sounds really weird, but at okay. three o'clock yeah, yeah. at three o'clock in the afternoon, you have a hundred people using one portalet. All the toilet paper is gone, and they're not coming and servicing it to the next morning. So, if you have that roll of toilet paper, you're now a hero for a junior or a mom or a grandma that has to go use the porta potty because yep. the paper is out. And it sounds really weird, but those are the things you learn as time goes on. If people are going, oh, I can't believe there's not a bathroom here. Or if you're in a park, is there a bathroom or where is it? Or is there a water fountain? Or some of the things with like sand volleyball that people don't ever think about is how hot does the sand get in the middle of the day? Um, you know, we did an event in West Virginia and they had a darker colored sand there. And at oh. one o'clock in the afternoon, people were getting second degree burns on the bottom. You know, they're blessing their feet. Same thing happened at a pro event this year yeah. for AVP. Oh. And there, no one was selling sand socks. Mm -hmm. And you had pro guys who had the bottoms of their foot were wrecked for yep. weeks. Been there. Oh. So West Virginia, we didn't have sand socks. So I asked the local, I said, hey, does anybody know a firefighter? And they're like, why? And I'm like, can they come hose down the court? Oh, firefighter from the court. They came back, they got the fire truck, put the ladder up, they got to show off for the public and they were, you know, spraying the courts and they had little kids running out there having a good time, you know, That's with such a brilliant solution. I would have never thought I, I come from a firefighting family and I yeah. would have never thought like, well, let's call the FDNY. Like maybe they'll hose it down for us. <laughs> they might, or you know, a lot of times if they have, you know, provisionary firefighters, they need hose time or yep. they need equipment to go out there, they need to use the hose. So why not uh, have a training them drill for a, a volunteer exactly. fire department, something like that? It's yeah. that's training. Hey, like and let's get the hose off the truck, let's you know, hook it up. And what if we had a beach fire? This could be a training, yeah. <laughs> your tournament could be a training event for local fire it, department. It could be a brush fire. You know, here's the brush yeah. fire. You know, how many times does you know California you have brush fires? Here's your response to come out and put out the hills on fire or mm -hmm get your equipment that's out there and the firefighters like it because now they're heroes and everyone's out there, you know, and they get to see, and then you invite, Hey, why don't you guys come down and hang out on center court and watch, or, you know, if you set it up, you know, say, hey, come hang out, meet some of our players, or you guys want to play later, we'll set up a place for you guys to play or, 
you know, here's some, whatever it winds up being, I got some water, you guys want some water, gator, whatever it winds up being, mm. you know, thank the firefighters. Or if you have extra shirts, go to the firehouse afterwards and say, Hey, thank you guys for coming out. Here's some tournament shirts. Here's some guys, swag. Do that anyway. Go to your local fire department, go to your local police department and say, guys, thanks. Here's a shirt. Here's a basket of fruit. Here's a, you know, rack of ribs. Uh, the FDNY gets to experience that sometimes. Yeah. But man, for, for those people, anybody in the service, I, I don't care if you're tournament organizer or not, go and do something nice for somebody who puts their life on the line for you. And the other thing is, is don't forget about the people that are super important. I always look at it as who can shut me down if I make them upset. <laughs> if yeah. you don't care the fire department, you got to take care of the fire department there, you know, fire department, police department, take care of those, you know, those people mm -hmm. take care of the lifeguards, even a quick mention saying, Hey guys, thanks for being on the beach. Thanks for keeping everybody safe and going on. Yeah. Cause if you've been around volleyball long enough, you're going to see a rescue. You're going to see something happen. You know, someone has a heart attack on the sand court. First people to get the lifeguards, mm -hmm. you know, make sure they know what's going on before your tournament go ask the head lifeguard. Hey, is there an AED here? If someone has a massive heart attack, Who's my quickest response time yes. to do that? And people don't think about that, but I always find the lifeguard. Hey, where's your closest AED? Yep. It's better for me to come get you, call 911, you know, what is it? And take care of them. The other people, people never think, and they always take advantage of, the guys who pick up the trash. The guys that come and empty the trash cans, the sanitation department, we all see them driving up and down the beach. Yep. Take two seconds to say, hey, man, what size shirt do you want? Here's a shirt. Your courts will be leveled. Nothing will get ruined. The trash will be picked up. They'll come by and pick it up. And you thank them and know their names and you know, shake their hands and say thank you. And don't you know, hey, wait a minute, and throw trash in there. If you have a bag of trash and you're coming by in a truck, go over, throw your trash in the truck. Yeah. It's and a say, little thanks, bit man. of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, we're, you're out here busting your tail. We'll help. You know, at least I can do is help you. I'm not going to give you more work. I'm going to hopefully make it a little bit easier for you. Let's let's go back a little bit to sure. um, getting the getting the tournaments to sign up. So if we, if we turn it back, you know, we, we kind of ended on get the word out, talk to juniors clubs, uh, the mm -hmm. post on social media nonstop, ask other people to post. Even mm -hmm. on that post, we should be like, please share this. Um, yeah. First time person. How do they collect money? Should they worry about a website right now for first things first? Should they do it through Venmo or PayPal? Um, there, I can tell you when I run my events, there, there's plenty of, of companies that are out there that are happy to take your money for a fee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can handle the registration for you. Um, you can do Venmo, you can do Cash App, whatever it winds up being. Um, what I did when I ran mine was I ran... Um, Online, they have a lot of free online stuff like Yahoo has it and Google has it. Google has spreadsheets and at Google, is Google Forms where you can actually handle registration online for free. Um, so you create a link, you go to Google Forms, you create a link, which you get player one, player two, names, addresses, emails, whatever your information you want. You can get actually the emails. have get the emails get the and email phone email. numbers because you know, phone numbers, social media address, the clicks, whatever it is, you whatever information you want. Yeah, that's out there. And the important thing is, is get the right phone number, get their cell phone number. So morning of going, hey, are you guys coming? It's 750. We've been talking all week. Are you coming? Are you not coming? Because I've got to run this pool mm -hmm. and it's going to be a difference. The difference between a 17 pool and a 16 pool. That's a really big difference. And the last thing you want to be doing is at 830 trying to go refix everything after the first yeah. matches have been played. Um, so, but if you have their home phone number and they're using their cell, which I know it seems weird and old school, but you're calling somebody at home and they're driving, you're never going to get hold of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, or texting them, you know, or say, can I text you information so you can do the reminders the day of? Because if you have that text, you can send the massive text out through a lot of free services that Friday night before saying, hey, reminder, check in starts at seven, close at seven thirty, captain's reading seven forty five, and people see that reminder going, hey. I have it. You know, I'll say that. Yeah. As the tournament organizer, like as soon as you get somebody's phone number, put that contact into your phone. So oh, yeah. that the morning of you're also not, Oh crap. Like I need to text everybody at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, anything like that. And for me, what I do is I put, uh, if anybody is associated with our company, I put BAB in front of it. Mm -hmm. So they're a beach, like right in front of it. Yep. And then I'll put their name 
That way, if I'm looking to add people to a group and I need to do that group text, it's all I do is hit B on my phone and then everything populates. And now I can say select, 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 instead of thinking like, oh, uh, now I got to text Gene and then I got to text Xander and like. <laughs> yeah, whatever works for you to yeah. keep that system going, whatever it winds up being. Or I can't tell any people if I'm Craig Volleyball or EVP Craig when I was doing tour for so long. It's, mm -hmm. you know, everybody know, no one knows my last name. It's just that's Volleyball Guy Craig, yeah. uh, <laughs> which is interesting. You know, but, you know, communication is key. And so, you know, get that registration online. You can do it, you know, that way you're gathering the information that you need. Plus you're building a marketing database for the future. Yes. People sign up, you have those emails. So now you, you can put in there, would you mind if I hit you with more things, you know, future events. And it's a click a button, especially using that Google yes. form. It's there and it's easy. Do not um, just take the payment. Get the contact so that the next tournament, it's slightly easier. Yeah. And you can <laughs> and you can link your PayPal sign up to that Google form, okay. so you can actually oh. when they hit the submit form, it takes them to a PayPal site where they put their names in, and you get their credit card, and then you get the email. So you get the email with the registration and the payment. Nice. So it look, as the tournament director, it looks seamless because now they're going from registering to the payment, mm. as opposed to I have to go here to register, and then I have to go Venmo or I have to do this payment wise. It's all kind of one form. And there's plenty of opportunities to do that. Um, and then you can decide, do you want the person paying the couple bucks for the fee or do you want to eat it yourself for registration? You know, that mm -hmm. charging fee that goes on with the PayPal, whatever it is. Um, and the other thing is, is do your best to get payment ahead of time because people who pay for things ahead of time are more likely to show up than people who are waiting to pay the day of. Yeah. Um, which sounds, a lot of people go, oh, I'm just going to pay when I get there. Really? Well, nope, you're not know. in the tournament yet. Yeah. No, you're not there. Or are you really, did you had too much fun on Friday night and you're not coming in? I don't have your money. If I have your money. You're showing up. Mm -hmm. If you don't, then you're probably not showing up or, Hey, it's kind sure. of gray out or, Hey, it's going to be hundred degrees today. I'm not coming. I didn't pay. So get that money ahead of time. And yeah. you know, like you said earlier, give discounts for early birds and make it go up as time goes on mm -hmm. and give people multi event discounts as well. Um, I oh. do a lot of events, which is Saturday and Sunday. So for like example, with my juniors, I tell all my juniors, if you pay to play in the women's event on Saturday, I'm only going to charge you 10 bucks ahead to play juniors on Sunday. Cool. So it's just kind of that you're getting double play. Plus you're getting double people playing. They're getting a discount for playing. It's a little more paperwork on your end because you have to figure out, you know, discounts and stuff, but it gives people a chance to, you know, pay to play or, Hey, like if I do a thing right now with, with DME, we do a Friday night lights program. Um, we're 730. We open up the courts. They're open. It's 10 bucks ahead. You can come out and play until you get tired. We'll turn the lights off and go home. Nice. You can pay 10 bucks a night or you can pay 50 bucks for the next three months and show up whenever it is. Love that. So you show up once, you show up 10 times. It's still that way. So pay ahead of time and we're good to go. And I'm trying to keep it cheap so people are playing. And that's I much rather if I'm going out for a sponsor and looking for sponsorships, I want to have a hundred people playing in my event or, you know, three times a year, as opposed to 10 people playing this there. If I'm charging a hundred bucks a team and I get 10 teams, that's a thousand bucks. Or if I get a hundred teams at 10 bucks, I'm still making a thousand bucks, but now I'm able to go after that sponsors. Yeah. still the same money, but now my sponsors mm -hmm. are where my profit is. Do you think people should worry about sponsors off the bat? I, I personally I do. don't think so at all. Um, no. I think you should be so concerned with growing your event for the first mm -hmm. year or two. And then, well, you know, once, once things are a little bit automated in, in that, then like maybe you can start sending out emails or hire somebody to go out to companies and say, Hey, this is how many people we have at the event. Yeah. Do and it. you can, and you but can there's so much waste of time and people trying to chase sponsors. Yeah, I, don't, I don't chase sponsors and I, a lot of my sponsors come naturally through it okay. and I'm honest with people and I go, okay, here's what you want to sponsor. If you want a a frame, it's 250 bucks. Okay. And that's, that's my cost for it. So now as an event director, I have ball dividers. I don't have to go buy them. My sponsors are out there and it's there and it's not super hard for me to do. And I'm not making or losing money off that first year because they're there. Second year. Okay. Now your sponsor, Hey, I still have your ball divider. Now it's a hundred bucks for year two. So that's, pure profit. And remember, right. if you're going to do guys, if you are early on, if you're going to do sponsors, you have no idea how much extra time that is going to add. It is not mm -hmm. going to add so much extra money in the beginning, but it will crush yeah. your time and it will potentially ruin a relationship because 
you have to talk to them in the beginning so that they know where their thing is going. You have to take pictures for them during the tournament, get videos mm -hmm. of it, get, get all that information. You have to send them stats afterwards saying, this is yep. how many people we had. This is how many people had your stuff in our hands. And then you have to talk to them again for the next time. Because if you don't do all of those things, they will never sponsor one of your events ever again. Because like, yep. oh, we did that five years ago and we didn't get anything out of it. And now mm -hmm. you might be 10 times the size, but because you're associated with it and you did yep. it crappy the first time, they won't come back. So don't get sponsors, yeah. in my opinion, until you are established and you've built yep. your systems first. And you have people that are there to handle it because day of a sponsor shows up and you're in the middle of doing pool plays where you're doing playoffs and you have 10 pools coming in and the sponsor's there and they've paid you, you know, some money, you're going to want to get up and shake their hand because they're going to feel like you're ignoring them. They go, hold on a minute. I, I have to, let me run these events. Then I'll talk to you. And then two hours later, by the time everything's going, the sponsor has gone. They're like, Oh, that guy blew me off. Yep. You know, so you have to figure out what's going on. So if you have a friend or someone that wants to give you a hundred bucks, 200 bucks for a ball banner, great, but don't go out and getting those, you know, Oh, we can get $200,000 for sponsorships. Oh, you can't. No. Um, <laughs> No, it's and if you do, you should be working in Silicon Valley, you know, yeah. where they if, fundraise every day. <laughs> you know, or if you say, "Hey, I'm going to have 10,000 people at the event," and you show up, and there's 50 people, and a sponsor shows up, because mm -hmm. you don't know who's going to show up the first couple of years. You know, build your database, build your picture, so you can say, "Here's opportunities that are out there." Yes. And now here's your chance to go do it. Take a picture of, and this is what our event looked like this year. Use Photoshop, throw some of their banners in, or throw some net graphics on, or whatever it is or get the sponsors. If you know someone say, Hey, I'm getting nets. My cost is 500 bucks for the net or whatever it winds up being. Um, you can sponsor it and we'll have it up there for all the events. I just want you, you know, you need to buy it. Or if your friend runs an auto garage or seven, eleven, whatever it winds up being and you're friends with them, Hey, do you want to do this? We'll get it up there and then we'll play on it the rest of the year. If not great, if not, then go get your nets. Yeah. Um, you know, it's an opportunity for sponsors for me is an opportunity. It's not going to be there in the beginning. It's, and that it's really, like you said, it's really hard to keep sponsors happy <laughs> as One, time goes. On. It is. One thing that just came to my mind is that you yeah. have to, because people will always come up during your event and say, hey, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Please just have one piece of paper set that says, interested in our events, tournaments, write your name, write your email, write your phone number, because... Yeah then you can contact them again. But if they walk past and they're interested and you don't get any of their information, mm -hmm. I'm telling you right now, they're not going to go home and Google you nope. perfectly in time for the next event so that they can sign up. So just get yourself one single sheet of paper mm -hmm. so that they can write first name, last name, email, phone number, and say, we'll contact you tomorrow. You know, We'll get you on our email list or what, whatever, but uh, have that ability for the on-site people. On a clipboard. Yes. Hey, this is thanks for coming. Here's the information. If you put your name and phone number on here, and even if you want to do something with that, do make it associated with it. So if you have a PA, hey, come sign up for our interest list. Out of the interest list, we're going to give away a free koozie, or we're going to do this or something on it. So it gives people an incentive because people like stuff. It could be a 99 cent koozie, but they're going to sign up for it. And then you have that list. And what's the worst case scenario? You create a database. And maybe they come play. Maybe they don't. But at least you're getting the information out. Yep. And how hard is it to give someone a koozie or a t-shirt or sticker? People love stickers. I can't yeah. believe people yeah. still love stickers. But <laughs> yeah, they true. do. They love, they love them. Computers and phones, everything. Yeah, it's amazing. It's <laughs> If you get some, a little sticker for the back of someone's case or, you know, their phone case or whatever it is, they love those things and it yeah. goes good for you or temporary tattoos, whatever it winds up being, we use, you know, we use lanyards. People yeah. love lanyards. They're super cheap, super easy. Um, you just go to uh, stickermule.com and they have stickers, but they also have like lanyards. They're yeah. really cheap. And then people see them literally every day because they attach mm -hmm. a, a lanyard to their key and people yeah. don't know, you know, what's missing from their lives until they, <laughs> until they get yeah. a free lanyard. And like, this is awesome. <laughs> like I have a, I have a little, little keychain with a, with a carabiner on a little clip on it. I don't mm -hmm. know what I do without that now, just even for being at events, I just take it and clip it to the tent or clip it somewhere else. So I know where my keys are. Yeah. And one day it, broke and i went and i was like oh this is the worst day of my life because i don't have like <laughs> you know I, don't, I can't clip on it i gotta get my keys in my pocket i'm gonna lose them yeah. um you know on the beach tournament that gets they get heavy as the day goes on <laughs> yep. so, at least with anything but yeah craig uh, i've kept you for two hours now 
No, it's been a while. Um, I I do have uh, uh, another meeting coming up, so no I, I want to wrap this up. But I I you know I I would like to utilize you for some mentorship for me for sure. us and uh, I I don't know how that'll look or what what type of time you have, but you've you've proven yourself to be an absolute resource. Uh, just by giving all of this free information to people who, who want to start volleyball in there. Like this episode on its own mm -hmm. stands as its own course, you know, for, to be able to be able to build an event, what to look out for and, and at least yeah. get the steps rolling. Uh, so I know that I have your information, but yeah. if anybody else is out there and they have any questions or they need to contact you or they're interested in your academy or your events, uh, how how could somebody reach out to you, or, or what website should they go to to, to um, get in touch? They, they can they can look up DME Beach DME Academy Beach Volleyball. Um, okay. That is out there. Um, I think you had some of it listed earlier on the link on there. Um, we're on Instagram DME Beach VB. You can find me on there. Um, that's probably the easiest ways to do it. I think it's Craig Leninger at DME Sports .com, um, is the email address. You can do that. Um, it, it, you know, just kind of get out there. I'm, I'm the only Craig Leninger that's in the United States that I know of. So if you Google my name, you're going to find me, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it's there, but you know, that's kind of, yeah, it's there to do. And there's Instagram that's up there. So find that. And, you know, I'm here to help anybody that wants to help or anybody that's willing to listen. I'm always happy to share ideas because like we talked about earlier, it, it's, you know, getting people out there and playing it's, we've got to get people doing the right things and get there having great experiences. Cause we want to grow this sport. It's, it's the best sport in my opinion in the world yep. and more people should be playing it. And it's brought me across the world and back and I love every day of it. And it's my passion to go out there and do things. And it's, you know, I'm happy to help anybody that wants to do it and happy to help you guys out in any way we can. And, you know, just let me know. I'm here for you. Awesome. Guys, it, it, you know, along with what you see on screen, if you're listening here and you check the show notes, uh, we've put all of the contact information that Craig's allowed us to to put there. So if you want to get in touch with them or you're wondering, you know, little questions like insurance or, or, or what that LLC or S Corp or, or just starting an event or if you just need some confidence yeah. in starting it, this guy's somebody who's worked with major, major organizations and each one that he's touched has then become a jump in success. Uh, so absolute resource. And uh, I'm so thankful that uh, we got to have this conversation, Craig. I, I just want to yeah. thank you, really. This was awesome. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun. I always enjoy talking about it and just keep going and going because I enjoy it so much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love it. Well, let's have you on again so we can, uh, sure. we can dive deeper into one of the other you know, 20 things that you're excellent at. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. I'd be happy to come back anytime. Let me know. Awesome. All right. All right. Great. That's Good it. Uh, I'm going to run. And uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate Thank your you. time. Thank you. All right. Have a good Bye. one. Yeah. Guys, I, I, that episode blew my mind. I, coming into it, not kind of knowing where we're going to go with the conversation and then being able to absolutely go to school uh, in terms of tournament facility uh, event organization i'm telling you right now that <laughs> whether he likes it or not i'm going to try to lean on craig's for for advice in the future and uh see where we can go but if you save this episode or you subscribe right now or you want to share it with a friend remember that we we all probably know somebody who's thought of or is attempting to try or start uh just putting together a tournament or an event. You know, I think a lot of us have, have looked at an event or a tournament and thought like, ah, oh, I could probably do that. This is a great starter pack for you. And I really think you, you could share this lesson. You could save this episode and refer to it again and again so that you have that step-by-step -step process to really get started. So there's a lot of gems in here for anybody who is, uh, is really going up that alley. And I'm so happy that we got to have this episode where we can really give you guys a place to start and actionable steps to take to start your own event. And don't be afraid to start your event. And I'll tell you one thing as well from my experience. Don't be afraid to let people know that it's your first time. I know that we all think that we have to like look and seem professional. Uh, with my online 
members and the people who are learning from me in beach volleyball, I lean on them to tell that, to, to help me say like, Hey, where does my website suck? You know, what, what am I not showing you that you needed to know before signing up, uh, for all of our camps and clinics, we send emails afterwards saying, tell us your worst part, the worst part of the experience. Tell us the best part of your experience. It is completely and 100% okay to say, Hey guys, it's my first time running an event. I think it's going to be awesome. I'm going to work my tail off, but I want you guys to be open with your opinions all the way. I, I'm not going to tell you to accept everybody's opinions immediately because you're going to change too many things before you actually get started running and then you might get stuck. But have a form set up and have an email ready to go after the event that says specifically, tell me the two worst parts of the entire experience. Tell me the two best parts. Right? Have them be honest and, and, and ask both questions. We send a lot of those emails and messages and we leave ourselves open so that we can advance, we can grow, and we can create better things. Um, and hopefully if you guys ever come to one of our camps or clinics, you get to experience all of the change and reformation that has come with each event because we love listening to our players and it's for them, right? Like the, the whole thing is for them. So I uh, have that set up as well. All right, man, this is packed. Uh, this morning fired me up. I hope you liked it. Please throw us a share, uh, throw us a subscribe. I think you can rate our podcast somewhere, somehow, if you can, and you liked it, give us a good rating. If you hated it, send me an email or send me uh, a DM at Mark Burick on Instagram and uh, help me change and make it better for you. All right. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. Hope we're able to uh, give you a ton. I, I know I got a ton out of this conversation, so I hope you did too. And as always, we'll see you on the sand.